Welcome, welcome back. You made it. Ooh. <laughs> so we'll, so everybody come in. We'll, uh, we'll get started here in just a second. As everybody comes into the second to last session, after us, <laughs> we've got Ben for some closing remarks. Um, just by way of introduction really quick, uh, my name is, is Brian Crofts. I'm the Chief Product Officer of Pendo. So at Pendo, we're really crafting and creating this thing called the product cloud, which is really the tech stack for product teams and designers. And it's really this combination of powerful, actionable insights matched with tools that you can take an action on, ultimately to improve your product experience. And so we've been on this really exciting journey of building products for you. And uh, we're really excited to be here. I'm Adrian Gajevnik, and I lead the design team at Pendo. Cool. Well, today uh, we're going to talk about something we've been calling the modern product team. And we've been having a lot of discussions about, well, what does that really mean? And what are the things that we can bring to you on this Friday afternoon that hopefully add, add some value? Um, and so to start, Adrian's going to tell us a little story. <laughs> um, so I'm a newish mom. My daughter's two and a half now. Um, love being a mom. It's definitely overwhelming, can be initially. Um, and the one thing uh, you don't really realize is how often they get sick. Um, so my daughter looks like this a lot, right? So, you know, I work full time, so does my husband. She's at daycare, I think even at daycare, it's just like snot every week. <laughs> um, and so why I tell you this story is, you know, the first time she got sick at three or four months old, um, it's very overwhelming when they're that small and they have runny noses because you don't know what to do and you call the pediatrician and they're just like, hey, just turn on the humidifier, use that bulb syringe thing they give you at the hospital. And so I use that bulb syringe thing, which it doesn't, it doesn't really work. Um, and I remember this product that friends of ours had told us about called the Nose Frida. Have you guys heard of this thing? <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, Swedish company. Um, this thing's amazing. It's call, also called the snot sucker because that's exactly what it is. <laughs> so you take that, that blue piece, you put it to the kid's nose, and then the red piece in your mouth, and you, right, you suck. There's a filter. So <laughs> it, it shouldn't get in your mouth unless you forget to put the filter back in, which I, you know, have done a few times. <laughs> but it's your kid, so it's okay. But um, th this thing, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Um, the older they get, it's not as okay. But uh, this, this product is amazing, and it's one of those things where you, you, know, you hear about it through your friends kind of on the playground, or, you know, hey, what should be on my baby registry? I'm about to have a kid, and this is like hands down the one product that I recommend for all new parents. Yeah, uh, and, and it's funny, when Adrian was talking about it, I had no idea about this product. I come from the bulb syringe era, or generation, <laughs> and so my, my wife and I, we live in New York City, and we have four kids who are a little bit older, not babies. And I literally, when she told me this, I was like, Rachel, my wife, we've got to have another baby. Like, <laughs> <laughs> because, because of the nose Frida, this is awesome. <laughs> but anyways, we're not really here to talk about the nose Frida per se, but we probably sold a few um, just now. But the idea is, is this, and, and this is really our strong point of view that we want to bring to you guys today, which is, you know, um, word of mouth is number one and there really is no number two. And it also, you can refer to it as, you know, product is, is the new marketing. Um, and the idea here is that when we are talking and go sharing stories, I had stories, she had stories about why we loved products and it all started from somebody sharing it with us. And so we've been going on this journey and saying, well, we build products, we build software, and our team looks something like this. And it's a, it's a modern team, right? It, it is three individuals or three representatives of design and product management, engineering, and of course we saw from, from Pluralsight and also with our team, data science. And so 
what we've been going on this journey is having this discussion about what are the attributes, what are the things that we need to do as a modern team to be able to be more efficient, to be smarter, um, and to really get to that next level. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, just briefly, as we've been talking about what does this modern team look like, we really have kind of broke it up into three things. Number one is this idea of empathy. And I think we've all, I, I love how the craft of product management and design has evolved to where, yep, we all get it. We all believe in customer empathy. But what we want to talk about today is a little bit how do we become more efficient at it? And how do we involve that product team that we just described, the data science, the engineer, the product manager, the design? Now with that, lines can get blurred, but we want to talk about how to get comfortable with that, how we've had to get comfortable with it. And then of course, we hear all the time, you need to be more data driven. Well, what does that actually mean? Well, what we're going to talk about is how it makes us smarter and more efficient and how even when we're designing, not just product management, but how designers can use data to make better decisions. And last, this idea of how do we create and build upon high-performing teams? How do we create the right environments, the right environment to fail, to do these different types of things, to learn fast? And so this is what we're going to cover today with a few stories, and hopefully um, that adds a lot of value. But we do this for a reason. And the reason is to make our customers happy, right? Uh, to allow them to do their jobs better. Um, so we start to see that through, you know, higher, um, uh, more in product engagement, as well as promoters versus detractors, right, through NPS surveys. And then the other side of the coin is, is happier employees, right, just more engaged um, teammates who are actually, you know, shaping the product and are really engaged in the work that they're doing. And this is just a recent, like, we do NPS, e NPS right, employee NPS to kind of um, have a way to quantitatively kind of understand how happy people are, right? Just to, um, to, to see that from a data perspective. Yeah, and so one of our perspectives is the modern team doesn't just get the outcome. They get the outcome, they get the customer outcome, they create happy customers, but they also love doing what they did and they would do it again with that same team. And that's what we're trying to create when we're talking about the modern team. Now, um, in, in, in talking about and being more customer-centric, I want to tell you a story um, from when I was an early product manager. And it's, some, it's a story that really helped me understand the value of, of bringing everybody from the team. At different times, we have to be thoughtful, we have to be efficient, and bringing our engineers into the process of, of customer empathy. So here's the story. So Matt and I, we went, and this was when I was at Intuit, and we were building QuickBooks, and we went to an accountant's office to understand a couple of workflows. And we did the very traditional, we went into their office so we could see how they operated in context. And um, as the accountant was going through, through, through some of the workflows, he had a couple of issues, got stuffed a couple times. We were taking notes, we weren't interfering, we were just observing. And then from there it turned into a Q&A. And we were talking about some of the things and he was describing where he was really getting hung up. And I'll never forget this when in the middle of the conversation, literally, I mean, and again, you're trying to treat your customers with respect and listen to them. Matt just stands up and walks out. I'm like, I like kind of had to apologize. Like, sorry about that. Um, I probably just had to go to the bathroom, whatever. Um, he can be a little, little crazy. Anyways, we continue it, and I'm, I'm, I'm like listening to the customer, but I'm also frustrated. And I walk out to the parking lot, I text Matt, where are you? And I get no response, and I'm like, screw it, and I drive back to the office. And the reason why we drew this picture is because it was the memory of when I came back to the office, and I was a little mad, but like, at the same time, I'm like, hey, engineers can be weird sometimes. So can we, right? But we, I go back, and I'm like, Matt, where were you? And he's like, he didn't even say anything. He didn't even look over. He's like, I can solve this problem. I can solve <laughs> this problem. I can fix this. And what hit me was when we bring engineers into the experience and bring that empathy, not only do they have empathy and understand the pain, but it drives a certain urgency that can create more efficiency in the actual product development process. So now we want to talk a little bit more about some of the tactics we use to involve the whole team in a more efficient way 
to work with our customers. Yeah, ex an example of this is every time our customers fill out an NPS survey within our product, uh, we actually integrate that and send that straight to a Slack channel. Um, and everybody has full visibility, transparency into that channel, which is pretty cool uh, because previous experiences I've had, you know, certain people kind of hold on to the data and you might not have that transparency. So it's pretty awesome to watch responses come in. Even but, though we don't let them see the scores, right? Yes, so, so, sorry, we blurred out, you know, <laughs> a lot of data, out. GDPR. Um, <laughs> right, right, I just had to slip that in there. Um, but the cool thing is you see the most chatter when there's detractors. Because people, you know, employees are like, hey, why did someone give us a two? Like, what's going on? And um, it's pretty awesome to watch engineers, product managers, designers, sales, customer support managers kind of get in there and, and provide context. Or if the customer has actually given a reason, like, hey, I'm having a really tough time, you know, using X, then we're able to, sit, you know, to figure out who's the right person to reach out. Um, and then, like, recently I was tagged because they were talking about, hey, it's hard to navigate. And I'm like, this is a great person that we should talk to because we're actually working on our navigation redesign. Um, and so grabbing product manager and engineer and setting up a call with that person to kind of talk about, you know, the struggles they were facing um, is super valuable. And another thing that we do in a similar vein is we have a customer advisory council. Um, I think a few of you are here. Thank you um, for being on that. But uh, recently, we had a product manager, um, Shannon, who is kind of thinking about some new features that people are, our customers are requesting. And he decided to, to you know, real time, like, hey, if anybody can jump on a, a call with me, like, right now, and give some feedback as we're kind of shaping this feature, it would, really, it would really help to have some insight from you. So just an example of kind of getting real time feedback um, to helping shape and influence product. Yeah, and what's great is, you know, with a lot of technology and tools, it will just throw a Zoom link right into the Slack channel of our advisors. And if they're available, they can just jump in. Mm -hmm. And if an, a customer jumps in, we say, hey, engineers, come over and let's watch this. And so it's a very efficient way to expose our engineers and the broader team to some of the things that we're wrestling with in terms of design uh, and product. I think you can totally picture her saying this. Everybody's a designer. Everybody's a designer. Um, <laughs> you too can be a designer. So here's the thing is we actually really embrace this idea. Not the fact that we believe our engineers and our product managers are nearly as good as Adrian and Kelsey and Caleb um, in terms of design. But what we really like to do is incorporate everybody on the team to be thinking in terms of design, whether it's sketches. Because what's really interesting about it is you say, hey, that's a designer's role. But I know in my experience and others' experiences that on the earliest ideas, an early low fidelity prototype that you sketch out, a couple of things happen. One, you get a little bit more immersed in the problem, right? The second thing is you start to actually build a little empathy for how difficult this design is going to be. You say, gosh, this is a big design challenge, and we're going to have to work through this. Now, you know, versus the other way, right, which is um, it's a design problem, you figure it out. So again, the, the, this idea of modern product teams is that we're more involved in every aspect of the development cycle. In blurred lines, it, it does create confusion sometimes, but I'd rather take that and working through that than having a very siloed effect. And so on this next screen is a bunch of sketches that our product managers have done when they're thinking about just ideas that they have. And they're just really low fidelity sketches, ideas. And one of the really cool things that we do uh, with our customers is we'll take, let's say, a design, a, an idea, and we'll find that segment of users on our platform that might be interested in learning a little bit how we're thinking about it. And we take that sketch and we actually put it right into the product they can click a little icon, a little Envision icon, and it serves up this Envision prototype right in the app. Now, for B2B, that's great because, you know, I don't know if you guys have done B2C, but you can use these great things like usertesting.com. But the reality is, like, they're more consumer-focused, not B2B. 
And so in our world, we're able to go right to the people, B2B customers that are using our software that are very interested in a new part of the experience. And so they're able to go through and then give us feedback and schedule real time a meeting with us so a product manager can show up the next day and have five um, a calendar invites from people that are really interested in building this together. So that's a few ways that we do work um, to get more efficient. And, and Adrian and I were talking about this early. We, we actually don't have all the answers. We, we struggle and debate all the time about is this right? Is this effective? You know, of course, like any PM and designer is going to say we're restricted on how many engineers we have. Um, and so we're always thinking about how can we be more efficient, but also get them involved. And I don't think we've nailed it, but there are some things that are trending really well. OK, so th this is something Brian said to me when I first started. Um, design without data is art. And to be honest, it rubbed me the wrong way for a while. And I don't know if that's because you know originally my background was more in visual design. Um, but I think in the context of the work that we do right, in product design, this, this completely makes sense. Um, it's something now that everyone's talking about data. What does that mean? We've talked a lot about that the last couple of days. And um, there's, you know, there's always this balance of qualitative and quantitative data. Um, and in, like Brian was saying before, you know, designers and not just product managers are trying to figure out how to leverage data to be smarter, to, to be faster and more efficient. And, and sometimes larger teams have you know, dedicated user researchers. Even smaller teams do too. Um, we're kind of in the camp where our designers, like we're the ones running usability uh, test sessions with our customers. Um, so this is something where, as we're moving fast, you know, both sides of the coin, whether you do have research or not, you don't have the luxury, right, of testing every single feature improvement or UX improvement that you make. And I think that's where quantitative data really can come in and fill those, those holes. Um, so I'll just give you an example of the way that our team uses quantitative data today. Um, so we do something where we kind of map out our core kind of workflows or, or paths where we can say, OK, let's start <coughs> at point A. Maybe that's you know, from a dashboard, where are users going? Or hey, um, how, did they get, how did they get to this point? So kind of from both directions. And then we can kind of segment based on, OK, what are our admins doing versus our end users? Or kind of what is the general trend of customer behavior? Um, and so one recent example of this is we were sort of monitoring one of our major workflows. We started to notice that people were canceling more than they were saving. And we were like, wait, why? Why would they cancel out of this task and not complete it versus saving it? Um, so what we did to kind of, I think, round up that feedback loop is then we created um, an in-app message that we pushed out through our product to ask that segment of users who were canceling why were you doing that? You know, we saw you're using this feature. You know, could you give us some feedback on that? Um, you know, through this text field. By the way, it would be great if you, you know, we could schedule a call with you, um, if possible. And this is something we use a lot. Um, kind of these in-app messages for <coughs> recruiting customers for usability test sessions too, which is something I know we all kind of struggle with. And just going back to being smarter and more efficient is just really helpful. Um, and we just kind of, again, get that quantitative and qualitative uh, feedback. Uh, and I think an another way of kind of doing this from the beginning, which we talked about uh, a little bit earlier today, I think is kind of setting that hypothesis early in a project and, then and establishing goals and what those goals actually are and working closely with product managers and, and even with engineers possibly. I'm like, hey, we're going to this is this project we're working on. What are the goals? What, is what are we trying to measure here? Um, so that everyone's kind of on the same page. Yeah, and I'll give, uh, so I'll give a lot of credit to Adrian. You know, I, I did make that very cheeky comment that, you know, design without data is just, it's just art, right? And it's a bit flippant. But, but what I love about kind of Adrian's approach is like, okay, I'm going to get into this. I'm going to actually experiment. And I've, and she's taught me a lot in terms of, gosh, when I can, when I can first start with a quant and really drive down to like, this issue in the product, it's super efficient. And then we can start doing some of the research, some mm -hmm. of the customer calls. And, it's, and she's really done this really great job of balancing the two. All right, this last section that we want to talk about is this idea of 
managing creativity, and I've talked about this a little bit for those who um, follow me on Medium and um, actually did a podcast here, uh, uh, the, what is it, um, We Need Another Meeting, um, about, about this subject. Yeah, there's a little plug. Um, you should listen to it. Um, but we talked about this. It was a really fascinating subject of, that I've been focused on because the way I look at it is, at the end of the day, my most important product is my team. Um, and so I try to apply the same types of principles of being data-driven and running experimentations, but more important, it's what kind of team are we structuring. So the first comment I want to make is this idea about it's so important, and I think so many people would nod your heads, that it's so important to get the team right, so much more so than getting the idea right. And I love this quote. This came out of, um, I think, just another plug, one of the best um, books on management, especially in our field, is Creativity, Inc. And one of the lines was, was this, uh, from this book was, was this, which is, you give a good idea to a mediocre team and they'll screw it up. <laughs> right? We've probably seen that. Now, on the flip side, you put a mediocre team or a mediocre idea to a great team and they'll either fix it or they'll scrap it and come up with something better. And we've seen this a lot with our teams. I'll come up with an idea, I think it's pretty cool, and the team, again, will either scrap it very directly, almost surprisingly sometimes, or they'll make it better. And I think that is so important. That to me, and I tell them, like, that's the sign of a good team right there. You're either taking my mediocre idea and making it better or you're scrapping it and moving on, coming up with something better. Now, there's another uh, thing that I want to talk about a little bit, um, which is basketball. First and foremost, completely devastated, almost didn't make it today. Big, big LeBron fan. Um, it sucks. And he lost, right? He <laughs> lost. Um, and I'm not going to get into that. I actually wasn't going to do that. It wasn't part of the plan. Um, but I want to talk about basketball for a minute. So in ninth grade, um, and I'm sure there's some of you that fell into the same type of thing, which is in ninth grade, I played on two different teams. One was like a, you know, AAU is still going on, but you also start to get to play on the high school team. What was really interesting is we had this, that is basically the identical team, right? So the variables were pretty much, there was no other variables except one thing, the coach. On the select team, there was a coach who yelled a lot. And the idea was we would go onto the court, the starting five, and our whole idea was don't make a mistake. If you make a mistake, you get pulled out of the game. So we optimized around not failing, not making mistakes. On the flip side, and we didn't win nearly as much, on the flip side, same group of guys, different coach, and he let us play. He realized that we had to work a few kinks out. We had to fail a couple of times. He believed in it, he trusted in us. And so what did we do? We played to win. We were way more aggressive. We took more shots. We, we more fast breaks. We hustled, we played hard. Again, same exact group of guys, different coaches. And so you think about that, and it's this idea of, you know, whether it's a basketball team, whether it's a product team, but creating a culture of zero failures, counterproductive. Let your team fail. Now, to further um, discuss this point, let's talk about Google, because um, we have to talk about Google at some point today. Um, so Google. So Google did this massive research project, and they were on this quest to find what are the attributes, what makes up an amazing team? Because they saw a lot of disparities. Some teams were amazing, and they had this person, and this person, and this person. Okay, let's replicate that. And then they didn't perform as well. And so they looked across 100 or 200 plus attributes and over 185 working live teams. And they came up with five things that really led to a high performing team. And the number one by far, the number one, it wasn't snacks, it wasn't a ping pong table, it wasn't any of that. It wasn't the smartest people in the room, it was this. Is psychological safety is the more impor most important when you're creating a high-performing team. So what does this mean? It means that we need to create an environment where it's okay to take big risks and fail. That it's okay to come up with a different idea 
and accept it and experiment it and try with it even if it does fail. It means to create a feeling of safety. And this is, this is, not, this is easier said than done. I think there's a lot of trial and error in this and there's a lot of discussion that needs to happen. It doesn't mean that you know, we can have a big team of millennials and we just create the safe environment and every, you know, no feedback. And it, no, it can be rigorous and tough, but it needs to be a place of safety where people trust, right? And, and so to me, you know, again, when you think about the team, when you're structuring your team, number one, the team is more important than the idea. They'll figure out the idea. Number two, you've got to create a place where it's okay to fail. And you've got to create psychological safety. So I think to kind of summarize what we've been talking about, you know, it, that modern team, again, uh, getting everyone kind of a seat at that table, everyone involved, everyone kind of co-creating, which leads to better product, even though sometimes it might feel like you're stepping on people's toes when product managers might be wireframing and designers might be writing acceptance criteria in JIRA, um, or a, you know, an engineer questions your design decision and why you did X. But I think getting everyone to the table, having that empathy, um, and being more data-driven, um, and uh, what Brian was saying about you know, managing creativity, I mean, that is kind of the modern team today. Cool, and with that said, this is, Again, you know, to really caveat everything we said, we're still working on this, right? But the little, the little bright spots, the little, um, the, the, the different things that we're seeing in terms of, you know, getting engineers more excited. Like, it's so great when you can get an engineer both understanding the vision, having empathy, and also that urgency. And we've seen it. You know, you see teams that have engineers that they don't care, they don't know what we're building, and their output is so much different than those that really believe. And so it's really upon us as leaders of these product teams to create that environment, to use data, right? But don't just say use data, right? Like give them examples. Start, as Adrian pointed out, start with a goal. What's our hypothesis? And then start measuring and all of a sudden you're data driven. And a lot of these things will start to play out. All right, well that is our talk on the modern product team, but before we walk off the stage, we have oh, yeah. a gift to give away, right? And yes. we have a winner. So if you didn't know, back, uh, back there um, in the, um, where all the booths are, we're the pink booth. You can't miss us. And we had a big bucket of, of pink crowns. And actually, to be honest, the funniest thing was people coming up and thinking the crowns were swag, which is like, we could do a little better than that. Um, <laughs> But the big idea was you come over and you guess how many crowns are in the bucket. And I think we had somebody that nailed it exactly. So without further ado, and the prize is this. Um, this is one of my favorite things. All those product sketches that you saw up there were done by, not this one, but iPad <laughs> and a pencil. So this is, this is the, uh, the gift. And we have a winner. Who's the, the winner? Yeah, the winner is Paul Kersey, product manager from Overstock.com. Where guessed, is he at? Yeah. He guessed 619, and there were 618 in the jar. He had to okay. take his dad to the airport. Okay, we'll, well give we'll it to somebody else. We'll figure out how to get it to him. <laughs> Art, do you know him? You can come up and grab it. Yeah. <laughs> Hey well, man, it's recorded. He, he's going to know. At this maybe point, now. it's up to you. But like, uh, choose the right, right? Choose the right. I know. Hey, I know my audience. Choose the right. Okay. Cool. Well, thanks everybody. You guys Thank have been you. great. We got one last speaker. Uh, it's been great to be here in Utah. Thanks for welcoming us, and have a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you.